ain't Gorilla B. The content of this channel is for mature audiences. Parental discretion is advised. You're tuned in to the Green Gorilla channel. Please make sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and hit the bell notification button. And please, feel free to share the video. Thank you. What's good, everybody? I'm the G with a PhD. You tuned in to the Green Gorilla Channel. It's the place where black men can express themselves freely, straight up, no chasers. Now, before I get things started, I want to give a shout out to all the members of the Green Gorilla Channel, like I always do. I want to give a shout out to Lee Ways. Thank you uh, for becoming a member. Jeffrey Speed, thank you. The Nameless Protagonist, The Face, Raiz Muaji, Mark Swift, Show Me, Black Dog, Odd Collard, Craig, Raphael Brown, Omni Americana, Deanne, Donald Watts, Barry Little, Ryan Jackson, Hip Hop.ca TV, 
Coach DC, The Remedy, Kashif Caldwell, Infamous Chillin', I Am Black Man, Nichita, True King 337, May Rest in Heaven, Force Windu, Mr. Blue Collar, Barnolas, Kyle J. Sura, I'm Just Jules, The Book of Ronin, Ab Media 83, Damon Harris, Brian McMurray, Mr. Lou Meth, TD Hip Hop Media, Drew Main, Shop Talk Live, Mr. Heat, Afro Analyst, NEU, Isa Abdul Zahir, Sir Anthony, Deshaun Nolly, MLR, Charles Rogers, Universal 178, Blacksword 404, Rashid Barnes, Aaron Smith, DH, C Truth the Revelator, Gold Professor, Black Pill Ned Stark, Author Unknown, Dr. Tiasan Johnson, Brian Williams, Kalan Jakala, Sherrod Martin, Ricky Dawson, Cedric Bowman, True 7360, BK Born Shaheed, James Washington, Hostel Adept, Seventh Coast Dojo, WPR1, Roguish the Billmonger, I Care, BGS Ivmore, Marvin Battle Jr., Kwaku217, S. Haywood, Dragon59, Supreme Ivmore, Adrian Hicks, Jay Bailey, Mr. Michi, Mo Mal, William Ruffin, and Asangwa. Thank you all for being members of the Green Gorilla channel and to help me continue to keep things going and to make things happen here. I appreciate all of your help and all of your support. Y'all deserve a round of applause. Thank you, thank you. You get my high signers. I appreciate y'all. And if you are inquiring about how you can become a member of the Green Gorilla channel, well, here's how. I'm the G with a PhD, and you're tuned in to the Green Gorilla channel, the place where black men can express themselves freely, straight up, no chaser. Today, I want to introduce you to my new membership program that consists of five levels where you can invest in the Green Gorilla channel on a monthly basis and receive level specific perks. Memberships are special because they improve the quality of the content of the channel and will help me to be able to keep the channel going. Now to participate in the Green Gorilla Channel membership program, all you have to do is hit the join button, which is located right next to the subscribe button on my channel page. Now for all of my subscribers who decide not to participate in my membership program, nothing will change. The content will keep coming the way it always has. Thanks for watching, and be careful out here, people. Bless. Oh man, I'm mute again. My, my bad. I apologize for that. Thank you so much, a sower of seed, for <laughs> correcting me, man, because I would have been talking up a storm without even knowing it. Every now and then, I just forget to turn the volume back on after I go to a commercial or an interlude or the membership uh, promo. So I apologize for that. But man, we're back. And, uh, you know, I'm still without water. So I'm a little agitated and irritated. <laughs> we still ain't got water in this joint, man. And uh, I haven't been able to take a shower in six days, man. So, uh, you know, it started with three days of no power. And now it's moved into six days with no water. So, you know, it is what it is, man. I can't complain because I'm not the only one really going through it. But I am complaining a little bit because, you know, you get used to the accoutrements that come along with, you know, living in an 
advanced civilization, so to speak. You know, you expect the infrastructure to work the way it's supposed to. So it all, it's all, it's all to the good, man. It is what it is, man. But the day I came here, man, uh, to finish up what I started yesterday. And so I'm about to get to that, man, and make that happen. And, and look, you know, I'm not trying to go off on women, man, you know, uh, by explaining what I'm about to explain. Uh, but I just got to tell the truth and keep it real. You know what I'm saying? It just is what it is. If you want to know how we got here, we got to keep it real and tell the truth about how we got here to where we are. That's what we got to do. Because it's a lot of people making assessments and uh, a lot of people, you know, offering analysis. And that's cool. I mean, you know, you're entitled to say whatever you want to say or to feel how you want to feel. But, you know, it would behoove you to study the shit that you have an opinion about. <laughs> I mean, you would think that that would be par for the fucking course. You would think so, but unfortunately, that's not the case. Now, if you don't believe me and what I have to say about the matter, maybe you'll believe a white boy when he says it. <laughs> maybe you believe them. Because yesterday I went in and I had a conversation about how the ghettos were created and about how mass incarceration is now, or the penal sector of the state, is interconnected with the ghetto, the black ghetto, to where they're interchangeable. There's a revolving door between penal institutions and the ghetto and the value system of penal institutions and the ghetto and how black men maneuver around in it. They're almost functionally equivalent now. And I went into the ways in which the ghetto prior to uh, desegregation was qualitatively different than what you're seeing now. And it was on purpose. This was orchestrated. It wasn't something that just happened because, you know, niggas just, you know, niggas just don't got no values and no morals. Niggas just stupid and lazy and shiftless and spineless. Niggas just pathological and violent. Innately criminal. This shit was manufactured. And you would think that people would learn this and understand this. I mean, we, we're black people. So you would think we would have an interest in educating ourselves about the shit that happened to black people and how we've been managed. But if I say it, oh, well, them, them PhD niggas, they think they know more than us. They don't know shit. <laughs> man, look, man, I, look, as far as I'm concerned, man, I'm just going to keep it real. This is what that is to me, man. It's some, it's some goofy shit, bruh. It's some goofy shit. I'm just keeping it real. We're the only group of people that extol the virtues associated with intelligence and rationality. And then when you got people who can give you some assessment and offer and provide some correction, the first thing you want to do is you want to attack them. I just don't get it, man. I just I don't understand it, man. I really don't. I, I, I just don't get it. But you know what? I'm not going to even try to get it because I really at this point, I don't give a fuck, man. I just don't. I just don't care anymore. I'm just going to say what I got to say and get it off my chest. If you have a disagreement with what I'm articulating, I am welcoming you. I encourage you to come and debate me. Have a conversation with me and give me the reasons why I'm being erroneous and what it is that I'm saying. I'm, I'm offering the challenge.
if I'm somehow wrong in my assessment of the means by which black people have arrived to where they currently are in relation to this culture in which we live, thug culture or welfare culture. I encourage you. I'm asking you. I'm fucking begging you. Come in here. I'm asking. But you don't believe me. For some reason, you know, like, Negroes have a problem with trusting and believing in other Negroes because, you know, there are some token Negroes. But I'm not one of those guys. I've never been a token Negro. Not a token. <laughs> I've always been the type of Negro to test the, and push the limits and the boundaries. I've always been that way. Whatever space I'm in. And I'm a truth teller. And I don't care who I offend most often. I just don't. But that's just me. Okay? It is what it is, man. All I'm trying to do is give you some information. I started off yesterday by talking about black men. I did. I talked about how Negroes are a problem in this culture. We've been a problem since we've been freed. We've been a problem since we've been slaves because white people feared that black people were actually going to rebel, which they would have done. I'm guaranteeing you these are some martial people. They're the descendants of the Germanic tribes, the, the Gauls, the Visigoths, the Ostrogoths, the Vandals. This is who these people are. Now, I'm not, you know, one way or the other trying to add any kind of evaluation or normativity about it. I'm just describing the facts. It's the facts. And they don't have a problem with taking shit. They'll come and snatch your shit. And flip reality upside down and make it to where you're the one that's problematic. You're the one that's violent. They run this bitch. They manage it through violence. But it's controlled violence. It's calculated violence. It's not reactive violence that they use. They use cool, calculated, premeditated violence to control and manage your life. These are the facts. Now, if, if you got, if you have an assessment that's different than mine, I want you to come and tell me how slavery was able to be maintained for as long as it was and was productive as it was and was as profitable as it was without managed, calculated, and controlled violence. What was the Klan do to, during the Jim Crow era other than managed, controlled, and calculated forms of violence? What was ghettoization? Because a lot of people think that the ghettos just naturally popped up and they decayed and they became structurally, you know, inferior because of some agency on the part of black folks. But all black people did was move from the South and they came into white neighborhoods and white people got out and stopped investing in the infrastructure. Then they brought in the police forces and made all kind of shit illegal and used paramilitary style tactics in order to control the people they're in and siphoned off their bodies to prison because there was no more le uh, need for their labor. So I gave you that story. I talked to you. I told you about it. Okay. So the black male body is managed through the penal state. But black women, to be quite honest, they're managed through administrative welfare bureaucracies. That's the facts. Now, they can, you can look at it like, oh, well, they're getting all kind of goodies and gimmies and grab which to some degree they are. But there's a cost associated with that. Because anybody that knows that's received welfare or been on it, you know that you got to deal with the social workers. You got to deal with them people. And who are the social workers? Typically, white men, white women, increasingly black women. But the people who run these offices, they're not black women, man. 
they typically white women who run these bureaucratic agencies. They come into your house, they assess what's going on, and they, they basically give orders to women. I've seen it a million times. But maybe if you don't believe what I'm saying, I'm, I'm going to give you a recap and explain to you. A lot of people think that the ghettos and the poverty that black people are in is just because they're lazy. It's not true. It's just not true. So if you don't believe me, man, at least listen to a white man. Maybe he'll, maybe he'll make you or turn you into a damn believer. Check it out. Federal program that the uh, federal government uh, implemented during World War II uh, and afterwards, uh, during the New Deal, um, was the uh, Federal Housing Administration's um, program to create white subdivisions, white suburbs surrounding central cities across the country. And they uh, uh, built suburbs by guaranteeing loans to mass production builders of suburbs to um, uh, on condition that uh, those homes only be sold to white families, that no African-American would be permitted to buy homes. So, for example, uh, the best known example perhaps is Levittown, uh, east of New York, uh, east of New York City, where Levitt built 17,000 homes uh, in the late 1940s and early 1950s, uh, uh, which he could never have assembled the capital to build uh, on his own. Uh, instead, uh, the uh, federal government uh, guaranteed bank loans to Levitt to build that, sub that suburb on condition that we sell no homes to African Americans. And in addition, the federal government required that he put a clause in every deed in Levittown uh, that prohibited resale to African Americans. Well, this went on all across the country, and the mass suburbanization of the country, uh, California, the, the, the biggest example of subdivisions built all over California on explicit condition set by the federal government that no home be sold to African Americans. Wait a minute. Hold on. Let me get it cocked and ready. In other words, we got a whole bunch of new conditions for white people to move into subsidized through social programs, which is basically socialism. Basically. And gave them an economic floor. But they didn't give the shit to black folks. You get it? You understand it? So you ain't got to believe me. Let me keep going, man. Uh, once this was done, uh, the civilian housing then became available again. There would have been a big shortage before the 50s because no civilian housing was uh, built during the uh, war uh, uh, because materials, building materials, weren't permitted to be used for civilian construction. And there was a big housing backlog even before the war because of the depression. So when civilian housing construction began again in the 1950s, and the Federal Housing Administration subsidized whites to um, move into these all-white suburbs, uh, explicitly all-white by federal requirement. Whites began to abandon the inner cities and abandon the public housing, uh, which had been primarily designed for them before that time. Uh, there was a public housing uh, beginning in the mid-1950s, the white projects, and there were many, many more projects for whites at that time than there were for African Americans. White projects began to have large vacancies. Black projects had long waiting lists. And the reason was simply that the federal government was subsidizing whites to leave cities. The, the what? The federal government basically subsidized white people to get out of the ghettos and to move out of the inner cities and into the suburbs where they were going to make sure that they have gimmies and grab -ems. Now you talk to black people about this shit 
there are a constellation of black folks who are using the same tact as white folks. Well, you niggas need to work. You niggas they ain't doing nothing but just sitting around just sitting. You niggas need to get out and do something. Come on, man. That's where we are with this. Is this where we are with this? This is the analysis and the understanding that we have about how we got here and where we are. Come on, bruh. Well, industry then began to leave cities as well. And uh, so the African-Americans who were living in public housing uh, became poorer and poorer. Uh, jobs disappeared. White people were subsidized to move to the suburbs. Black people who are living in the ghetto, they moved from the South in hopes that there would be a better life for them apart from the South and the terrorism that they were experiencing there from the Klan. Cross burnings, ransackings, bombings. So they moved to the North and to the West and then they get hoarded into ghettos and then all of the work dries up and they give all these gimmies and grab to white folks. And then black people will be some of the hardest critics of black folks to, to understand the predicament that they live in. No compassion, no empathy, no nothing. Just a whole bunch of, I don't know. I, look, it, I just don't understand. I don't understand it. If you know history, you're so learned, you're so educated, you're so aware, then why the fuck aren't you aware of what's current? And what's going on? Why? That's my question. Why are you not aware of what's going on? Uh, and uh, African Americans were unable to gain the wealth that housing ownership created. So these policies resulted in greater poverty of the African American population. And I, and I wanted to ask you specifically about that, because this really isn't only about uh, residential segregation, as you just mentioned, it really is about the wealth that government policies created for white families that black families did not have access to. So when you look at the racial wealth disparities, the racial wealth gap today, you really trace it to these housing policies that started in the New Deal and that, that continued in the decades after. Can you? Now, let me just say this. The New Deal was social policy that was connected to, to some degree, socialism. These are just the facts, bruh. Now we can talk about, you know, the relative merits of socialism as an ideology versus other kinds of thinking about, you know, economics or whatever the case may be. But I've happened to take graduate courses in economic thought and theory. I've gone down the list. I know mercantilism, Malthusianism, Keynesianism, Fordism. I've studied it. But the reality of the situation is these policies were created to help poor white folks and it lifted them up and gave them wealth while they systematically denied our inclusion into these programs. This is what they did. This is why reparations is necessary. Now, are we going to get it? I doubt it. It's highly likely. But as soon as you get people talking about it now, it's a group of black folks that's going to push it back against it and say that we're lazy. And this is why we are where we are. And the white people are virtuous and hardworking and they're Protestants and that's why they got why uh, where they are. Explain to me how that's like some fucking critical analysis. Explain it. When you use white talking points back on black folks, I just don't understand that. I don't get it. But I'm starting to see it increasingly happen. And I just don't understand it. Now we can talk about the values of people in the black community, but you gotta talk about the structural and the institutional arrangements that led to the development of those values and that system to begin with. Because prior to our movement from the South into these places, we had the highest marriage rates. 
we had the lowest rates of single parenthood. All of a sudden we move into these urban ghettos and then everything come, becomes topsy-turvy. And we don't have any assessment other than you niggas is this, you niggas is that. You niggas this, you niggas that. I just don't understand it. And I do understand, like Man Friday right now says, unfortunately, GG, they have invested, excuse me, ingested concern. Look, you're going to, I don't mind conservative talking points. I don't. But you have to use conservative talking points with understanding. I don't care what talking points you have. It's cool, but just don't lambast black people without having all the information and half truths and half information. And Chris Morgan says, what the hell is an African-American? You know what it is, bruh. I'm not going to play semantic games with motherfuckers today. Fuck that. You know what an African-American is. Let's just keep it real. What, you going to start saying ADOS now, or FBA, or NBA, or NWA? You know what the fuck a goddamn African-American is. Cut the bullshit out. We know what it is. We know what it is, bruh. Can you really give us a picture of that? Sure. Well, uh, let me go back to that example I gave a minute ago of Levittown, uh, in, uh, which is the most famous of these uh, suburbs, uh, these 17,000 homes east of New York City. Those uh, homes sold uh, in the late 1940s and early 1950s for about uh, $8,000, $9,000 a piece. Uh, in today's dollars, that's about seventy-five thousand to one hundred thousand dollars, and as I mentioned, only whites could buy it. There were many, many African Americans who couldn't afford it to build uh, to buy homes in Levittown. A uh, hundred thousand dollars in today's dollars is about twice national median income. Working class families can afford to buy a home at twice national median income. African Americans as well as whites, but African Americans were prohibited. Uh, Instead, African-Americans were living in, in uh, cities and renting apartments. Whites were uh, able to buy these homes. Well, today, homes in Levittown sell for three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars $400,000. That's seven, eight times national median income. Unaffordable to working class families, to lower middle class families, whether they're white or black. So the white families who were able to buy into these suburbs that were created all over the country by the federal government, the whites only, gained two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars in equity appreciation for the next two generations. African Americans who were forced to uh, only rent apartments because they were not permitted to live in the suburbs gained none of that equity appreciation. In the United States, most wealth of middle class families is attributable to the equity they have in their homes. So Bam. End of story, end of discussion. These people ain't virtuous. These people are harder workers than black people. They were given an economic leg up through social programs. And these will be the same people that tell you you're lazy, you're shiftless, you're spineless. It's the same people. And we'll buy into that. And what do you gain from that? I just don't understand what you get from that. What do you gain from that? I'm asking the question. What do you gain from that, man? If you know the truth, you know we've been exploited. You know we've been left out. You know we've been relegated to violence and manipulation. And then you turn on yourself or your own people and you call them lazy and shiftless and spineless. Explain to me how that works, man. Explain it, bruh. Explain it. Explain it. 
Now I'm breaking it down into dummy terms. I'm, you know, because it just seems like the more I talk, the more people get inflamed for no reason. And I just don't understand it. Like I'm, I'm saying something that's a lie. These are facts, man. These are facts. So you find yourself in the ghetto. <coughs> you don't have money. The men that you're supposed to be connected to are left out of the system or put into the penal system. Then you're a black woman and then you, 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 you basically find yourself in a situation where you got to work or either receive aid and you got babies and shit popping off because the culture has changed. So now you got the welfare state and it's a self-fulfilling prophecy and a self-fulfilling uh, condition because it reproduces itself over and over and over and over again and again. Now it's beginning to seep into white culture. I know they didn't expect that, but I, I know for a fact, most white folks that have money and they have education, most of them, they're married, they're married people because they understand the value of family and reproduction. And they plan it. They don't just go out, fuck, and then deal with the situation later on. They plan their babies. Now, and the poor white folks probably don't, but like the middle class, upper middle class white folks, they plan to have families to carry on their legacy. We don't. We're just involved in hedonism. Because we're fucked up. We don't have an ethos. We lost it. We lost it. And these are the facts. We lost our ethos. We don't have the ability to punish, to reward, to praise or blame. Everything is managed for us. Now, if you don't, I told you, I, I let you know yesterday, when it comes to welfare, how did it start off? I said, look, in the early 40s, there was a National Resources Planning Board. And they wanted to develop a program for post-World War II economic growth and security. And they had policy initiatives that basically culminated in two bills, the Wagner-Murray-Dingle bills. Now, the National Resources Planning Board was part of FDR's New Deal. It was, okay? It was filled with sociologists, academicians, economists, politicians, lawmakers, a whole host of people. And they wanted to frame welfare as a broad form of public insurance is what they wanted to do. But there were people trying to block it. I told you who blocked it. I gave you information. This is academic, man. Go read the shit. Go do the research. You have fiscal conservatives on both the left and the right side of the aisle. Then you had labor unions. Then you had middle class entitlements from World War II that black people weren't able to get or buy into. So basically these bills were doomed. They were never going to pass. So you got conservatives, they basically said, look, this is dangerous to free enterprise and negative liberty. No, no go. You got labor unions and they pulled financial and lobbying support from social welfare programs or reform. Cause they got bread and butter contracts for themselves and their own me uh, members or their own union members with private corporations. Then you got administrative focus on from the Congress on middle-class entitlements like the GI Bill. 
So they drew attention away from the needy and the poor who were increasingly black. So they directed their energies instead towards the expansion of a middle class. That middle class was white. Now they gave money to them. They just found a way to exclude us from being written into the social contract. That's what they did. That's what they did, man. And then we sit and we use the idea of personal responsibility and individual choice as the means by which to try to explain some shit. Now, I understand that people are, you know, obliged, obligated to make good choices and decisions. We are. But come on, man, we got to cut each other some slack, given the circumstances that we've gone through in this country. That's all I'm asking for. It's for reality. You can form your opinion. You can say what you want to say, but at least know the reality. At least know the reality, bro. Now, when it comes to welfare, you would be surprised at how it first came to pass. A lot of people think they know how it came to pass. How did you even get a welfare state as large as it is now? How did it come to be? So if comprehensive welfare reform initially signaled the effort to guarantee public insurance for everybody, all Americans, it underwent a very radical change after the Wagner Murray Dingle bills of 43 and 45 died. So instead of comprehensive entailing the expansion of those deemed worthy of receiving assistance, or public insurance, it increasingly came to be understood as the expansion of therapeutic social services provided to problematic women. That's how it started. So in place of characterizing poor persons as victims of inegalitarian economic arrangements, social injustice or unfortunate circumstances, which they did for themselves, the New Deal was social welfare programs for white folks, man. But they were real programs that actually helped them, not piecemeal band-aids on bullet wounds. So basically what they began to do was to give a face to poverty it shifted away from white men and they moved it to white women. That's what they did, man. Overwhelmingly, the poor came to be regarded as troubled women. And I say troubled with air quotes. And they needed professional social services in order to get them straight. So you would be Remiss because a lot of people think that, you know, okay, well, social welfare was all about empowering women. Actually, they tried to educate them out of that shit at first. And I got my receipts to back it up. I know how it started. I know how it began. So you got divorced, deserted, and unmarried mothers and they were characterized as having moral, social, and psychological impairments. That's how it started. Because they were entering extant public assistance programs such as the ADC. Aid to dependent children. In large numbers, and they were causing public relations problems for uh, the, the policy makers. In large numbers, man, they were causing these problems. And there was one policy maker's name was Rudolph Dan Stett. A man from St. Louis, as a matter of fact. You, I'm guaranteeing you there's some streets named after this guy. Rudolph Dan Stett. He was the executive director of the Social Planning Council in St. Louis in the early 50s. And he came up with a solution. He said, look, we're gonna create social rehabilitation centers 
just like physical rehabilitation centers for ADC mothers. They were going to provide caseworkers, psychiatric and medical consultation, psychological testing, educational and vocational counseling, right? Job training, job placement, daycare, and homemaker services. Now, this was their avowed reason, but what they did was they set up the infrastructure in order to be able to influence people's minds paternalistically. You want what we're giving you, you got to listen to what we say. I don't know if you ever been to therapy and sat on a chair. Now, it's one thing if you're paying for that service yourself. It's another thing if you're receiving that service because it's a condition of you receiving aid. There's a difference. It's a difference when you're paying for something and somebody making you do something to receive something. It's a difference. On the one hand, you can walk out and do whatever the fuck you want to do. On the other, you have to stay there and listen. And basically, when Dan Stead came out with this model, the, the therapeutic rehabilitation model, everybody jumped on board with it. So the rehabilitation model became the main model. It wasn't about, okay, we're going to help poor people out in general, which is what they did for white folks, including white men. They helped them. They gave them houses, man. They gave them work. They gave them unemployment assistance. And they made sure that they got on their feet. They never made sure we got on our feet. And we the same guys will sit back and lambast each other for the fucked up predicament and the condition that we're in. I just don't get it, bruh. Now, yeah, some lazy motherfuckers out there and laziness should be discouraged. Because nobody's coming to save us. If we see it, we understand that. You got to struggle and hustle. And a lot of guys actually are. We're making it even though we've been excluded. We still live. We still rising. But how did it begin? I mean, begin. How did it get here? So it basically, Dan Stett created this rehabilitation model for public assistance programs. And then it became enshrined into federal law. So in 1956, you got something called the Social Security Amendments. And it basically solidified a change in orientation from a comprehensive plan for public insurance to a comprehensive plan for rehabilitation. The movement away from structural explanations of poverty and dysfunction towards subjective culpability accounts that could best be remedied through personal counseling. That's how this shit became entrenched into our culture. If you don't believe it, go research it. Look it up. So basically, when they came up with this model, everybody was willing to throw money into it in the 50s. But ultimately, what they did was the rehabilitative model actually, man, is intrusive and it's paternalistic, man. And they drove black men out of the fucking house. Because if you are being paternalistic in order to give some women some aid, you become, in effect, the fucking daddy of the house, man. This is how they did it, bruh. This is how they did this, bruh. This is how they made that happen. They came in, bruh, 
And they said, we're going to be rehabilitative centers to help women out. Now, just to tell you the truth now, basically what they were requiring, you talk about feminism, they began to preach feminism in the context of women receiving this aid. I mean, basically, they said, look, you need to be independent and self-sufficient. That's what they told women to this, these women getting this aid. They didn't say you need to find a husband. Where's your father, your children? None of that. They basically told them you got to be independent and self-sufficient if you're going to get this money. They wanted them to bring home the bacon, fry it up in the pan. And the problem that the ADC was beginning to have was the shifting clientele. Because first, I'm going to let you know, the ADC, the aid to dependent children or whatever the case may be, it had its inception in the continuation of mother's pensions programs that began in the early 1900s. That's how it started. Because a bunch of women were widowed because of the war or the wars that were being fought, the world wars. And so they needed to do something for these women. So it's more difficult to get legislation passed than it is to reshift, to change and to restructure extant institutions. So what they did was they opted instead of making sure that public insurance was given to everybody, men, women, black, white, Mexican, Asians, whatever, they just said, okay, we're going to help white women out. But it was a problem, though. Most of the recipients of aid from mother's pensions programs were white widows. That's just the facts. But over time, these programs, they changed. Because the clientele increasingly changed to unwed, non-white mothers. Now, when it was composed mostly of white women, it scarcely, if ever, came under public fire. But when the clientele changed, it became heavily scrutinized. So then they had to try to find a way to justify income grants to poor unwedded mothers, particularly black mothers. And you, you can't leave out the fact of race. We're talking about the 1950s and 60s. You want to know how we got here? You had to go through and examine the history of these programs and to see how it got here. And to see how it could have been circumvented. Because it didn't have to be this way. So what these experts, these public policy experts in the ADC did, they changed the program's initiatives. Instead of offering monetary support to poor women, they now offer them rehabilitation services, man. But that's a hard sell, and they knew it. So they devised a strategy that they hope would sidestep the rampant racial animus towards the public repudiation of the ADC. Basically, what they did was they began to whitewash the image of the people receiving the aid so that they can continue their bureaucracy. And basically what they said they were doing was fostering family values. But they really weren't fostering family values at all because they left men, black men, out of the fucking equation. They took a mother's pension program and shifted it and changed it. This is the problem. This is how this welfare shit in the black community started. Now, if you think I'm wrong, come tell me I'm wrong. Come explain to me how it is that I'm leading you astray on this issue. I know what the fuck I'm talking about. I sat in a library, man, for 40 days and 40 nights studying this shit to try to figure out what the fuck occurred and what happened.
Actually, I spent more than 40 days and 40 nights in there. I was in there for years trying to fit together the pieces of this, of this puzzle and to figure it out. Instead of actually looking at the true sources of poverty and dysfunction amongst poor, black, and even the unwed mothers in urban environments, which actually was ghettoization and deindustrialization. This is the start of all this bullshit. Putting black folks into urban areas without investing into it and keeping up the infrastructure. Then you make sure that deindustrialization takes place. Negroes ain't got no way to make money, especially black men. Then you get a powder keg waiting to explode. These people didn't even want to handle the problem. This is where this culture comes from. Ghettoization and deindustrialization. And these people knew, man, that the racism was a problem. They knew it. And they knew it existed within the ADC. They knew it. And, but these people didn't fight for civil rights within the welfare system. They didn't. They just didn't. They didn't give a fuck. And all they wanted to do was turn a blind eye to racial injustice and to continue to get their money so their bureaucracy could be maintained. That's what they did, bro. And instead of attacking racial domination and oppression head on by conjoining themselves with reputable civil rights organizations and leaders, they wanted to mitigate the so-called racist effects by offering services to a supposedly psychologically impaired group of women. They really are not psychologically impaired. They're just doing what's in their best interest given the circumstances. Now, it might sound like I'm trying to be a safe haven for hoes, but I'm trying to be descriptive and explain what the fuck occurred and happened and how we got here. Then we can begin to issue moral valuation later on, but I got to describe how it got here. I don't think black people are psychologically impaired at all. I think we've been dealing with a series of fucked up goddamn conditions and nobody wants to talk about the reality of the conditions. Instead, if we do what's easy and we talk about fucking morality related to Jude uh, Judeo Christian theology, which is simplistic. But at the same time, they get all the help and the aid and the social benefits and programs. And then we sit there and we deride people who get these Band-Aid programs that never was intended to lift us out of poverty at all. They was designed for motherfuckers to stay employed and to basically rehabilitate dysfunctional people. Dysfunctional. I say that with air quotes. Now we are dysfunctional. They created the fucking dysfunction. They designed the dysfunction. Now the question is, what we gonna do about it? Then that's the next question. What do we do about it? What do we do about it now? What do y'all want to do about it? The damage has been done. This shit is beginning to fall into the larger popular culture. All based on some shit that some, some policy leaders or so or some policy makers, what they decided to do in order to prevent black men from having shit.
I'm telling you, this is classic divide and conquer strategy. It's classic, bruh. I'm evaluating it from my own perspective. I see what they're doing. They take the man out of the equation, and then they get to offer psychological services to unwed black mothers who don't have daddies in the house. This is how we got here. Because they took a mother's pension program and changed it into an aid to dependent children program. It was never designed to help out unwed mothers to begin with. They could have did the work that was necessary to give black people an economic floor. They could have done right by us a long time ago, but they just did not do it. They didn't. They ain't do it for black men and they ain't did it for black women. And now we sitting here at a gender war having all kinds of fucking fights with each other over fuck shit. When the only thing that's going to actually pull us out of this shit is unity. But we don't want to hear that shit. But we can't resolve and get to unity without handling the problems and being frank and open and honest about it. And it's some fucked up shit black men do. I think at least black men in the manosphere admit there's some black men that do fucked up shit. But I can't get no uh, admittance on the part of these women that they do anything that's absolutely fucked up. That they're exploitative, that they use the system, that they turn their backs on black men. It wasn't always that way. But this is the shit we dealing with now. And you ask me if I'm wrong or right. I'm telling you what occurred and how it happened. They wrote us out of the economic contract. That's how we got where we are. But they write themselves in and then call themselves virtuous at the same time. And they deride and, and stigmatize you. They created this problem. They could come up with a solution to this problem. They did it for themselves. They created a middle class for themselves. Right now, they don't give a fuck. Like you got Republicans right now and conservative thinkers on the right. They don't even give a fuck about the middle white middle class. So if they don't give a fuck about the white middle class, you know they ain't going to give a damn about the black poor. You know that. I'm just being honest. Marco, thank you for becoming a member of the Green Gorilla channel. I appreciate that. Now, look, I'm going to tell you. So we got a new person here. It's me, Chi. Hello, GG in the chat. Well, you know, look, my, my show is a little, little vulgar. You know, I go off. We keep it straight, no chaser here. You know, a, a lot of times I'm like a fiery preacher but we cursing <laughs> but this is the situation we find ourselves in where, where young black girls in the ghetto feel that the only way that they can get out or get some sort of aid is to have a baby and to get on state assistance and their daddies ain't nowhere around and part of that is because of black men being irresponsible, but not all of it. Part of it lies, the responsibility lies with black women. And let's just be honest, man. A lot of black women, like they got the highest rates of divorce, the highest rates of any demographic. 
So if you dating a black man, to be perfectly honest, to get a whole bunch of bread and money and to fulfill the Disney idea of, of what the good life is, you, you, you do need to swirl. You need to start swirling. And stay swirled. Because it ain't going to work with us. Now, if you want to build something from the ground up and have a firm foundation, then come rock with us. But if you're looking to use us and the manipulators so you can use the system, you on some coon shit. I'm just saying it. I'm just keeping it real. You are on some coon buffoon shit. Because there's some black women out here doing the daffy dance too. Real talk. It ain't just exclusive to men. It's a lot of women doing the Daffy Dance. <laughs> a lot. But we can't say that, though. We can't talk about that because that's off limits to talk about. Cause that's going to hurt black women's ego. Cause well, you know, and then black men will come and say, well, you know, I, I have a mom. I love black women. Look, man, everybody that's here right now, for the most part has a mother. There ain't nobody on the earth that's living right now. that don't have a mom unless they were born in like a artificial womb, which I don't think they got that technology worked out yet. Or maybe they do with animals, but, the vast majority of human beings have mothers. But guess what? The vast majority of any other, they got fathers too. Otherwise, how the fuck did they get here? <laughs> Tell me how they got here. If they don't have fathers, how the fuck did they get here? Answer that question. Oh, wait. Every child is here has got a mother and a father for the most part. Even if you go to the sperm clinic, they still, somebody still donated that sperm and they got a daddy somewhere. But we don't honor fathers anymore, don't see them as important anymore, precisely because of the welfare state. And it all came from racism to begin with. Because in the 1930s, in the 40s, in the 50s, when they helped out white folks and they gave them public support and social programs, they made sure that white men got it. They went out of their way to make sure that white men got aid and support and subsidies. They didn't write them out of the economic equation. And you got black men doing the same shit that them white boys were doing, fighting in wars, risking their lives to defend this nation, and they still didn't get the gimmies and the grabums that they got. And here we are in the 21st century, and you got black people talking about how lazy black folks are. Man, burn them to flames, man. Laziness is not the issue here. Although there are some people who are lazy who are black, I'm sure there are. Every group of people has lazy people in its population, man. That goes without saying. But the reason we're here is not because of laziness. It's because of policies and institutions that we were excluded from. We have not been allowed to enter into the American social body the way that we should have been. Now, if you disagree with what I'm saying, I encourage you, please come and holler at me about this. I'll rip your ass from limb to limb. And I'm not trying to use the comportment and the speech and the articulation of some dispassionate white guy. 
This is starting to irritate me, bro. I'm already irritated. I ain't had water in six days. This is starting to irritate me even more. They're managing our lives for the worse through the prison and the welfare state. And we can't see the forest for the trees. All we know how to do is issue blame to one another. We can't punish each other, though. None of us can punish each other or reward each other. That's the problem. We don't have an ethos. Our ethos is the white ethos without the white money. And you wonder why we keep fucking up and going wrong. You wonder why we got a thug in a welfare culture. And those black people who do got something, they run the fuck away. That's the first thing they do. They run. And they run right to white folks. And guess what? Soon they buy that crib in that house where them white people are. If they don't hurry up within a generation, if they don't get the fuck out of there, that property is going to depreciate in value because white people will run again. That's what they do. I'm telling you what they do. It's all you got to do is look at the trends and you'll see what they do. They run. 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 They run. Many of the problems that exist in our community could have been solved a long time ago. Could have been nipped in the bud. All these people had to do was give black men and black families, introduce us into the social body. Give us the same kind of programs that were given or afforded to white folks. Problem solved. Dysfunction over. Everything done. But they wouldn't do it. But see, look, it's me. See, listen, listen to what I got to say, because look, I can't I can't post her comment like I would do if I was in StreamYard. She says, in all honesty, I'll take women to admit It'll take women to admit that the system lured them away and gave them freebies to make them feel superior, not because they are, but so they would look down on black men. But it's deeper than that. They didn't even give them real freebies. Not freebies that actually work. Now, a freebie is allowing you to pay or subsidize your payment for a house or to take out a loan or on a home from the federal government that costs less than it costs for you to pay rent. That's a freebie. Giving a motherfucker a voucher for some milk and some cheese and shit. And then saying that you're superior because you got some cheese and you live in a fucking uh, a housing complex. That is not shit to brag about. Yeah, I, hear, I feel you. But it ain't even freebies. This ain't even no freebies, man. That's throwing dust. It's throwing dirt out there. The GI Bill is a freebie. Welfare is an insult. It's an insult. I'll be right back, man. I'm going to show you a commercial, man. I got these people. I, th I hope they about to turn my motherfucking water on. Hold on for a second. I'll be right back, man. Black male studies started off as an academic argument. 
Okay. I thought I was making an intervention into history by just trying to show people that black men were victims of rape during slavery and Jim Crow. And it was just that. It was only that. Just an academic argument. Until I started actually meeting black men who were victims of rape. Who were raped by their mother's friends, teenage girls, or other men who lived in their own neighborhoods. Your whole life changes when you hear grown black men holding back tears or speaking through the pain of physical, sexual, or domestic abuse in the hands of black men and women who should have loved them, cared for them, or at the most basic level, not harmed them. So look here, y'all. Uh, I'm back, man. And uh, right now, I, I, I got I to gotta go because they about to cut the damn water on. Praise the Lord! So I will holler at y'all later, man. I'll be back tomorrow, man. Y'all be peaceful. I'll rap to you. One.